Hello and welcome to Alive and Composing, the wonderful world of Innova, with today's guest, Peter Curlin. Would you state your name for the record? Yeah, uh, my name's Peter Nye Curlin. And, uh, P- Peter what Curlin? Nye. Nye. Yeah. What, where does it's the Nye old, come from? Oh, just an old family name. Right, not, not as in the end is. No. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 the end isn't Nye, because you were oh, just on. Oh, the end, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Got it. All right. <laughs> We are doing a longitudinal study of composers and their pets. Do you have a lifestyle that allows you to have a pet? Uh, yes, I have a very old cat named Mary. Oh. She's very blind, but she still uh, gets pleasure out of life, as far as I can tell. Uh, so, M- Mary, is that a family thing as well? Or? No, I just never had a female cat before. and uh, Anyway, just, <laughs> just seemed... I had just one of those uh, spontaneous decisions. With a lot of um, music these days, especially from the jazz tradition, you make the piece and then you have to think of a title for it. Right. Yeah, but like you have a cat and you've got to think of a name for it. And this, uh-huh. how, how do you come up with your titles for your otherwise abstract music? Or, or is it less abstract than it seems? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I usually, when I'm working on a body of work, it has to do, it usually comes out of um, books that I'm reading and things that are just generally on my mind or things I'm worried about or, um, you know, just making music for me is about trying to figure out the world and figure out what it is to be a person and what it is to be part of, um, yeah, figure out what that means individually and collectively. And so my, this last body of work is all about, um, is all about, yeah, it's, it's about modern, it's about living in the modern world, but having like the inescapable connection to the primitive mind and primitive impulses and even reptilian survival, uh, yeah, survival impulses that we, I feel, are constantly trying to, um, just uh, we're constantly reckoning with on like a collective, in a, in a collective way and in an individual way. And so a lot of the songs are, some of the titles come out of things I've seen on the internet that I thought were examples of this. There's um, the, the kind of, one of the centerpiece of the album, I guess I like to think about it that way, is called Snake Eats Electric Blanket. And that's from a title that kind of, that was like the initiation of the entire project for me, which started a lot, like, and it was an, uh, a headline on a, on like Google News or something, maybe predating Google News. And it just, that's, it just said that snake eats electric blanket. And I just love that idea of the snake because something is warm, it feels it's alive, it devours it, and then that's a disastrous experience for this animal, right? To have eaten something that it thought was alive. Being fooled by things that are being fooled into thinking something is real and in fact it's a construction and um, so and I just kept thinking about that and I loved the ring of it and uh, anyway so it just stuck around and then uh, that song was like the um, yeah it, the, it was for a while I had a, a, a project where the band was actually called Snake Eats Electric Blanket and that piece was kind of a theme and then that the name kind of glommed on to that piece and so it's been around a while and gone through many stages yeah. and shedding skin each time yeah yeah exactly uh, we shouldn't really be talking about the album yet, but oh, okay. but but that's all right. 
cool. salamander. Let, let's say the word salamander. Uh -huh. And uh, does that relate to everything we've just been talking about, specifically the, the reptilian approach to survival in the world? Yeah, well, the salamander, it's all, the salamander, I got interested in that image. Um, I didn't realize this. Uh, or, well, it's something I learned relatively recently that the salamander in a lot of different cultures is, has a mythological significance and uh, there's, there was a belief that it could survive fire and that it, could, it was an animal that could not be burned. Um, who knows why? Like, why didn't someone just try to burn a salamander? But, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me. Um, but I love that, like, the kind of, I like the magical, like, uh, I like mythological imagery that has to do with nature, how that kind of is in us, and um, how that language, we still use it to figure out the world, even in a world where we're very divorced from nature, and I feel like there's a lot of confusion there, nature, whatever, you know, the... Um, Anyway, those of us who are urbanites, or those of us who are not, who just stare into a screen all day. Uh, so, um, anyway, it's just about that. <laughs> Behind you, we have some, some, some green leafery. Right. So, uh, it, people may not realize that we're coming to you live from the urban jungle of, of where are we, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, is that where you live? Yeah. Yeah. And how does that affect your? Uh, how, do, how you play your trade or the kind of music you make? Well, being here and making music here uh, has been, I mean, a, a very, just like a huge part of my life. And I've been here since 97 and I moved here because musicians who I was in a, um, I guess, a community with in Providence, Rhode Island before that had all moved here. And so I wanted to be close to that community. I had lived in Philly for a couple of years, but it was kind of a weird time there. I mean, it's so different now. It's just th a thriving scene there and people are really excited and there's new things happening all the time. But when I was there in the late 90s, it was like <coughs> dead, like nothing happening and you couldn't get anybody excited about even coming over to jam, you know? And uh, anyway, so I moved to New York and um, just got kind of attracted to all these different kinds of musicians and you know I came from kind of a rock uh, like kind of punk kind of uh, you know grunge kind of whatever background metal all that kind of stuff that was happening and in, um, in the 90s and 80s and that was the music that I loved and uh, but then when I came here, I started seeing a lot of improvised music and um, playing a lot of improvised music and really felt like I needed to create something where, create it like that that was the kind of music that I wanted to make that was some, that incorporated that kind of spontaneous, um, that kind of spontaneous uh, magic that happens with improvised music but um, yeah and I also started playing with a lot of people with I also started playing with a lot of people with uh, classical training and that's just such a powerful um, and just uh, the power of that really made an impression on me and I decided that I was gonna just try to attack that and learn that language as best I could given my you know um, yeah uh, without having to go back to school and read, start my whole education. I studied film in school. I was a fine artist and I kind of got, you know, I kind of uh, got pulled away from that in art school, strangely enough, into music. And so and I think it happens to a lot of people, especially in Providence at that time. It was a really uh, exploding creative scene. And it was, uh, do you think your music relates particularly well to film or to dance, perhaps? Yeah, I my you know I fell in love with a dancer and we worked together for um, you know on a few shows and I really fell in love with that whole creative world um, and had uh, really had, was hugely influenced by composers 
working in New York at that time. Uh, Chris Peck and John Maniacci were very, uh, um, anyway, just they're younger guys, but very influential for me. And that drove me towards like music technology, and I studied that for a while. Um, another kind of branch, you know, uh, of creativity happening that had a lot to do with improvisation, but also about, you know, it's just more about um, more about sound and less about playing and and a feeling of uh, you know and an idea of expression that was very much more about like an immersive sound experience that you get with dance and with film. Um, and so for me that was very, uh, that was also hugely influential and I met a lot of people who were kind of connected through the rock world and the downtown experimental world and, um, and the classical world through that scene. And uh, yeah, super important. You mentioned rock, metal, grunge uh, mm -hmm. growing up, but when I listen to your music now, uh, it has that kind of energy, but it, but the, the surface is much more polished. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's nothing fuzzy about the sound. It, it sounds really uh, uh, cleanly produced. Is right. It, do you think um, there's some of that uh, embedded in the deeper structure or the energy of it, or do, do you notice that uh, uh, the, uh, the edges have been taken off? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I love the sound of instruments and I love the sound of amplifiers and, uh, you know, whatever they may be. And I think the record, um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I really wanted to make, it's become really important for me, uh, like timbre is really important for me in composing. And w when I started to get into, you know, using um, you know, common practice notation and, uh, you know, I had, you know, and I was, I originally, I wrote a few pieces just longhand and then I was like, oh, I really want to be able to push things around a little bit more and I have this music tech background uh, and so I was like, oh, I should be able to dive into the software, but I just had like such a hard time with the digital quality of the sounds and, um, and uh, yeah, I just realized like I had to come up with my own process that was all about timbre, um, especially with the bass. I'm a bass player and uh, the timbre of the bass is incredibly important for the creativity for me. I, 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 for me, the, 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 the inspiration comes from the touching the instrument and playing the instrument in a dynamic way and, you know, controlling the timbre by playing different parts of it. And that stuff is something that just uh, is very, you know, it's very difficult to pr reproduce uh, digitally in the composition process. And so I was doing a lot of like recording clips and Pro Tools, bringing them over into, you know, arranging things there, uh, you know, and recording out, rec overdubbing on that, and then pulling that out, notating that, and then comparing it with the digital output, and you know, so it's like I c had to kind of come up with my own process that incorporated that. But back to um, the question of the the quality, yeah, um, yeah, I think uh, the yeah, I kind of got interested in um, in the texture. Like an, an like kind of an electroacoustic kind of quality of recording that combined um, all those things, and I think without guitars you just don't get like a kind of crunch. The bass has like we all you know when we recorded it we used like you know we used an old Ampeg B15 and a Trainer Bass Master and like those get pretty dirty if you turn them up, but really like. I didn't want it to be too associated with that world. I want like the things that I think, um, like I was kind of, I'm kind of more interested in the energy of that music, the immediacy of it, the, um, uh, and the simplicity of it, the directness of it, and the kind of, um, those kind of signifiers, I think, you know, that are like, you know, the sound of a guitar with a distortion pedal on it or a, 
um, you know, the sound of a very compressed, you know, drum kit with like a pounding kick drum. Just kind of lost interest in all those kind of signifiers, but still wanted to hold on to the feeling of like a rock band playing together, like playing music, like with an aggressive quality at times, uh, to spontaneously together, which I think is what makes rock music magical. Can you think of a time in your life when you had a really life-changing experience through a work of art? A, a painting, a poem, a dance, a piece of music, something that you thought, now, I, I, either I can do better or I, I, I want to be a musician, musician myself or that's right. really changed my worldview a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I mean, I feel like that happens to me all the time. <laughs> I was just thinking like, you know, I just saw this dance performance last night and I felt utterly changed by it. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, I think that happens to me all the time. Where, I, where it's really set me off on a different path, I think. Um, golly, I don't, let's see. I'm trying to trace back to like a, a seminal moment. It's kind of hard because there's so many of them, but you know, I don't know, I guess seeing, um, you know, it must have been the first time I went, to, first time I went to a punk show or a hardcore show. Uh, I definitely felt changed by that. I'd been to big, big uh, arena shows before I had seen like Billy Joel when I was in fourth grade and The Cure when I was in like ninth grade or something and then um, and then, anyway, but I was always like, you know, I just listened to music constantly, but I didn't know that I could play. I started playing really late when I was 18. I didn't, I, I just never really, uh, I just was kind of always rejecting any effort that uh, my parents or, you know, whatever. I, I didn't really get into, I didn't have like a musical training. Um, when I was young and so I got into it kind of late and probably because like I went to see seven seconds you know at this club in Trenton um, New Jersey and uh, it was just such a powerful experience and then you know a couple years later my bloody Valentine in the same club and uh, yeah that I mean that music was like you know I like I, for that for me seeing my bloody Valentine was like um, you know, it's, it, 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 when, uh, yeah, it's music that's outside a genre. Now it's not anymore, it's when I shoegaze or whatever. But when first, when it first happened, it was like, you know, like, how, what is this music? You know, it has this, like, really aggressive, like, um, you know, like, really, you know, an approach to music that's, like, total noise on one level but it's beautifully melodic and it's you know really challenging in terms of it's like you know it's erotic it's like violent it's, uh, but it's also beautiful and uh, anyway so it was uh, and it's experiences like that really getting back to the question after um, it's experiences like that where there there are things that defy classification, Ex art artistic experiences that defy classification that really have always been huge for me. Do you think that's present in your own album here? I try, for me, for my own music, I like mus I like genre music. I like, you know, I like to see a great, you know, blues band. I like to see a great, you know, a blues, you know, country, country, country and western, like, I love watching country and western bass players, you know, like their grasp of tonality is like so wonderful and and it, there's so much tradition there and you know the way they lead the ear is so great uh, and you know pretty much in all genres I, you know, I like music that I can, I really enjoy a lot of music that sits in a genre comfortably but when it comes to my own music 
I want it to be in a space where there, where you don't know, where you have to, where it asks you to listen to it and to make have your own feelings about it without obvious associations. Every, I mean, you can never really control people's associations, but for me, if it gets to that place where it's sufficiently ambiguous in terms of its genre, then I tend to be like, oh, okay, that's a good starting point. Is there a particular way you would recommend people listen to your album? No, uh, I, I mean... Or, or things to listen for? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that's a really good question too. I, I think it's, um, I was recommending it to a painter friend of mine and I was like, oh yeah, this will be really good for, you know, for painting. Because <laughs> it's not a good gym album because it's a little, you know, it's not going to keep you at, uh, you know, whatever, um, you know, 150 beats per minute or whatever it is uh, while you're trying to get to, you know, your mark on the, on the uh, treadmill, but... Um, but it does, it does keep you in the zone, though. I think, yeah. It's for a psychological zone. That, right. And I think, yeah, it, like there's a lot of different colors to it, but I do feel like it is, that's part of, uh, that's part of what I want to achieve in making a record is a whole experience and not a, you know, something that isn't like fractured and jumping around too much, but with a lot of variety that kind of, so like each tune is like a door opening to, into another room, but it's all somehow unified. And, uh, you know, the different, um, yeah, like, you know, taking you, taking you through an experience. I think a record should be something that you experience and not something you just put on to, like, um, you know, just hear one track over and over again. It's a beautiful experience. Oh, thank you. And so thanks for talking with us about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for doing this.